Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Spoiler Warning Podcast. This is review number 677 with a review of Annette. I'm Christopher Stacey. And I'm Stephen Miller. And if you're joining us for the first time, the Spoiler Warning Podcast is a weekly film review program. Each week in the show, we're going to dive in, debate, discuss, and argue over the latest films coming to a streaming platform near you. Um, this week, we had our first review of The Green Knight, which is available um, on, for VOD currently. We had a review of Reminiscence, which is available on HBO Max. And now we're talking about Annette, um, which is now available on Amazon Prime Video. So, Stephen Miller, this is our third review to record tonight. We would already be loopy if <laughs> if it was just a normal oh, yeah. recording session. I think this is going to be a very... It's either going to be the most interesting or the least interesting <laughs> review we do this evening i don't know which way we're gonna head yet to be honest <laughs> i mean much like the lives of these two characters it's all up in the air once we have a little baby <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah maybe carried by a drone <laughs> <laughs> man like the actuality of what is supposed to be happening there in the non-fantastical world is terrifying <laughs> yep it's absolutely terrifying but anyways, to get started, my real question for you, Stephen, I almost forgot it. If we would have not just recently watched the Sparks Brothers documentary <laughs> recently, mm -hmm. would you have recognized why the opening of this film is the, what it is? <laughs> you mean, would I have known that the band that we see is the band that is performing the songs in the movie? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um... But I think I would have assumed that the first guy we see is the director, the director Leos yeah. Carax. Yeah, who I didn't. I'm just going to say Leos Carax because his name is an anagram. Like, it's not his real name. And I don't know if French, they would pronounce it like Leo Carax. But I'm just going <laughs> to, I'm going to roll with it. <laughs> All right. So that's good. But like, <clears throat> I would have assumed that that was the director. And so maybe I would have assumed the people playing music were the people playing music in the movie. Um, I mean, it definitely the, wouldn't have had the same meaning to me that it does having watched the Sparks Brothers documentary. Yeah, yeah. and it wouldn't inform <laughs> right. your entire journey through the film. Because I had forgotten, even though it was billed as this many times, that this was a musical written by Sparks. Um, like, like, I believe this was... I, the music was written by them, but I think even the story was written by the guy who is the main songwriter in Sparks, at least in part. And like they connected with the director over it. But I think they were a driving creative force of the movie. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it, it's it's pretty damn clear. <laughs> Having watched yeah. that documentary and seeing like the their their body of work, um, mm -hmm. it all makes sense. Everything that I'm watching, um, I don't know if it helps me. <laughs> As I watch this film, um, but it definitely makes me go like, hmm, I know what's happening here. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's, uh, well, we'll get into it. I, I want to say I would have picked up on that even if I hadn't known who Sparks were already. Gotcha. Cool. Um, well, now that we've learned who Sparks are, <laughs> what do you say we jump into this review? Sure. We're going to take a listen to the trailer for Annette, and then we're going to come back, and we're, we're definitely going to talk about it. <laughs> oh, yeah. First time I fell in love. Woke up next to the girl. And escaped fast and far. The man has changed me. What I see in her is obvious. What she sees in me is... Hmm, that's a little more puzzling. One, two, three, four! This is my baby. Excuse me a minute. There's nothing sacred to you.
So that was the trailer for Annette. Um, it is about a, a power couple of sorts. Um, one who is a opera singer at the top of her career and one that is a comedian at the top of his career. And it's sort of the story of uh, what happens when they have a child together and how that affects their trajectories in life. <laughs> Stephen Miller, what did you think of Annette? So... <laughs> I had heard already that this movie was, like, uh, contentious out of can. Like, some people were really into it. Some people were really, really not into it. And it was very much... It wasn't the same as Holy Motors, the last movie that this guy made, which was kind of, like, universally rhapsodized as one of the best movies of the year. Um, this was much more like, hey, you're either going to love it or you're not going to love it. And I didn't love it or completely not love it. Um <laughs> I think there are things about this movie that I like a lot. I will I will list them. Um, I like the visual style a lot of this movie. The stuff is cast in a green. It's all meant to be very uncanny, like people are performing on a stage, even when they're not on stage. Um, and it has this kind of fairy tale equality that I thought was really, really cool. Um, there's like a pool in a backyard lit by green where bad things take place that I liked. Um there is a scene where they go on a boat caught at sea, which to say that it is bad production value is like, it is intentionally bad. It is like oh, yeah. rear projected waves are happening on top of a clearly fake boat while they sing and dance. And however you feel about it, I thought that whole vision of these people who are like, you know, it's going to be reductive, but they're all puppets, right? Like they're people on a stage who are performing for us and they're performing a morality tale and their whole life is based in performance. And I thought the movie got that vibe across in a way that I was pretty enchanted with. Um, another thing that worked for me a lot is Adam Driver. I think Adam Driver is really great in this movie when he's allowed to let loose. Um, there is a scene in Las Vegas where he is doing his bit as a comedian, he is like the least edgy, quote, bad boy comedian ever. You know, it, it, it is another one of those things where, like, I don't really get it. Um, the movie is making him very simple and reductive to the point of it being kind of ridiculous. But Adam Driver commits to it so hard. Like, there's a scene in Vegas where he is telling a story about tickling his wife to death, where he, like, I've never seen Adam Driver act like this before. He is, like owning the stage in a like totally manic ridiculous way and i was pretty here for it so um, so I, I have a question regarding that um mm -hmm. i might be misattributing this but i'm pretty sure it's adam driver like famously he hates to see himself he won't watch himself in in, in any things right like he's mm -hmm. walked out of interviews when they tried to play clips right yeah he will just never ever see this right <laughs> Like, I question. imagine well, he was at the Cannes premiere. I don't think he left the room for it. So I think he saw it because he famously smoked a cigarette with the director oh, yeah, during true. the applause at the end. True. That's right. I heard that as well. But it just seems yeah, crazy so to he me. Must that break he break his rule occasionally. Yeah. I, I mean, maybe in the context of like being at Cannes, um, he doesn't care anymore. But like in my head, I'm trying to imagine him with what little I know about the person even being able to do this acting. <laughs> for half of this movie knowing that people will watch it yeah and not being able to know it's one thing to like hate a new star wars movie that he is in right it's mm -hmm. another thing to consume this film for what it is and be a hundred percent on board for it <laughs> yeah i i think he is pretty fearless in this movie and i had a ton of fun just watching him go full gonzo like really commit to this ridiculous role yeah. um another thing i liked in terms of committing to the ridiculous i like the puppet baby i like annette a lot i i enjoy it is very like uncanny and kind of creepy and it's like a joke but the movie just commits and commits and commits to it and i actually like this kind of creepy twisted what are you doing with your daughter well like like it, who is she living for? How are you? Like, I thought it worked. I thought this whole kind of fairy tale puppet show operata type thing that the movie was doing worked really well. And it is crystallized by the baby, the fake baby that has made me laugh the most since American Sniper in theaters. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
Um, so I, I like all those things. There are things I don't like very much about this movie. I, I texted you very early on saying <laughs> like something like, I hope... I hope you liked that part in the Sparks Brothers documentary where they realized they could just repeat one phrase over and over again and call it a song. Um, you were not kidding. <laughs> nope. <laughs> this movie, again, kind of in operatic form. Like, I know, I know there are traditions that are like this, but this movie is very much people not only singing their feelings, but just singing their feelings repetitively and simply over and over again this movie is all i am sad i am sad what did i do i am sad like it it it, it the music i think is very grating i'm sure it is intentional so, about that gratingness i'm sure there's some smug reason for it to be grating but i found it very grating this is what i will say i think the lyrics are grating i think yeah, the, the music, music the overall is fantastic good. yeah yeah sure yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It, no, yeah it, absolutely right even the songs where they're just repeating the same lyric overall, if I could like machine learn out the lyrics themselves, I would be like, yeah, this sounds great. I like this. This is very yeah. nice. Um, you yeah. are right. I retract my statement. The music <laughs> is quite good. The music, when considered as words sung aloud, is very grating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I... I don't think it needs to be, but I don't fully know what this movie wants to do. I know little pieces. I know it's about performance, right? Adam Driver and Marion Cotillard both perform. They are like opposites in the most kind of like reductively obvious way possible. One is a comedian who, quote, kills. The other is an opera singer who gets killed uh, like every night, right? That is what she does. <laughs> so um, deep. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Like, it is all very obvious. And it's one of those movies where there's like, they're making a puppet show of obvious themes and then trying to get you with it anyway. And there are moments when I think it works like a character singing, surprisingly, that is haunting in a way that I didn't expect to be haunting. Um, there are, again, like visual tricks where it almost feels like Team America. Like you shouldn't find this meaningful, <laughs> but like they managed to get you anyway. But on a whole, I don't totally get it. I don't get this movie. So I don't know if I'm going to be able to defend it very well. Um, I thought it was an interesting experiment. I laughed at the fact that the movie existed and I had fun with the fact that it was doing all the shit. But I cannot defend it as like high art or a meaningful statement or anything. I feel like it is a bunch of people playing dress up with sparks playing music, trying to see what they can get away with. Yeah, so I, th I think I watched it two days after Stephen watched it. Um, and I, you know, I was sitting down. I had his text in my head like, OK, I know they're going to repeat the songs. The film started and I was a minute and 30 seconds in. And there was like screen glitches that were there for who knows? We haven't established enough for me to think it's like stylistically anything. Mm -hmm. There's just like things and then some stuff and some weird pans. And I'm like, oh, and I text Steven. I'm like, I'm not going to lie. I'm a little scared. I'm only like a minute, 30 seconds into this movie. I don't know what I'm prepared for. And then the first Sparks song started and I was like, this is catchy. I'm like, you know what? If this is as bad as it gets, I'm on board for this because this song's great. I'm I'm on board. I'm on board for a film starting with the director telling the musicians that they should start, and then they sing "Can We Start," and then the entire main cast walks around. A the, fantastic opening! Yeah, fantastic it's, opening! It's it's great. I'm like I'm like you know what? This is this is cool. I'm on board for it. Um, and then I started watching the next song, which is "We Love Each Other So Much." <laughs> And it goes on for so long. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hmm, this song, hauntingly beautiful, not as catchy. And I'm a little bit over it. And then I'm watching this like story. And then I'm watching the comedy that Steven really enjoyed from Adam Driver. I did not enjoy it <laughs> very much. Um, I So the interesting thing about this film. So in the past, Steven, we have talked about seeing... You know, we have watched films in that are non-English films, right? Um, and we have watched them, and we've oftentimes talked about how there are lines of dialogue you can do in another language that come off as, like, profound, beautiful statements on what it means to be alive. Right. And, and if you just said them in English, it would be, like, the dumbest, worst line that you've ever seen. I think this film proves why 
operas are not in English. <laughs> because I think the overall... Thankfully, no one can speak Italian. <laughs> But no, I, I just kept the help thinking of that, like, I like the staginess of it. Like, I like the mm-hmm. presentation of this as though you are watching an opera play out in front of you. Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily have a logical sense of when it bends between being real life and opera and not. Um, but it's but it's interesting what they're doing. The songs like I like musicals and this did not land with me most of the time. Right. All the songs where there are no lyrics, beautiful, love them, they're great. But I just don't really know what's going on with this story. And then they have <laughs> they have this baby that's a puppet, and I just went, nope. <laughs> didn't, I, puppet baby didn't work for you? Puppy, baby, puppet baby didn't work for me because it was, scar- first. It was scary <laughs> as hell. I, I will say, puppet baby has a beautiful payoff. With yeah. a reprise of the most hauntingly beautiful song in the, in the film, and that combination made me like. By the end of it, I was like, "All right, that might have been worth two hours and ten minutes." <laughs> yep. But did you like the payoff of Puppet Baby at the very end of the movie, the, where I, it uh, does some other interesting stuff? I think that's what I'm talking about. It. I'm what? talking about the payoff. Uh, of a visit that happens yeah yeah me, yeah me too i didn't think the song was related to that visit but maybe maybe they're I mean, connected but yeah so this is like i I've, i have never done this ever before in my life i literally went to the wikipedia for this film <laughs> and spoiled it for myself while i was watching it <laughs> because i just needed to know where we were going <laughs> <laughs> did it help it 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 helped me because we were at the hyper bowl game mm. <laughs> so at least i knew the film was almost done <laughs> yeah <laughs> there are easier ways to know it's almost done <laughs> i i know but like how many minutes are left and how long that feels are two different things um i yeah so so for me i think I think the operatic nature of this story works as an operatic thing, right? If it's a bunch of songs that are beautiful that you can't comprehend the lyrics to and you're just visually watching a thing play out, it's kind of interesting. But like because there is so much actual dialogue in this film, which doesn't necessarily attach to anything, I just found it hard to hard to maintain stamina. That's not to say there aren't moments that I really, really enjoyed. Like there, there are definitely moments in the film that I, that I, I felt were, you know, beautiful, impactful, funny, like different moments. There's actually uh, like my favorite, my favorite, favorite, favorite scene in this entire film is uh, Simon Helberg giving mm-hmm. his own backstory while conducting an orchestra. Yeah. And then so he's doing a, an aside to the audience conducting an orchestra and then he tells you to pause because there's a big swell in the music about to happen he does it and the camera's panning around him and then he comes back and continues telling you as the music calms back down and it happens a few times and i was like this scene is what i think the entire film thinks it is and Mm -hmm. this scene feels brilliant and gives me all the stuff i need to know about this couple from an outsider who's been present for their entire relationship and the context for the songs that couple sings to each other and like a bunch of stuff like that. And I was like, man, this scene is like two minutes long and does so much work to bring me into the story. And then yeah. that character takes more of a front front stage in sort of like, at least for a, a bit of the rest of the story. And like, I, I was reinvigorated paying attention to the story because I really liked this character who I'd seen earlier in the film. I recognized the actor. <laughs> But yeah. I, they didn't mean anything, and they make them mean something. Like, they, they did a magic trick of talking directly to me as I watched it and bringing me into the story as a side character and reinvested me in the story. And it's like, that. I really, really love that scene, and I wish I felt that way about the rest of the film, but unfortunately, right. I, just, I just didn't. Well, and I, I understand what you mean there, because what the movie is doing right there, I think is intellectually quote what the movie is doing all over, which is 
playing with you, putting you inside a story that knows it's a story, but carrying you from one scene to another as if like the artifice is supposed to make it feel more real, right? The fact that he is like furiously conducting and then pausing and talking to you and then furiously conducting again and saying, this is how I feel is supposed to hit harder because it is like, this is all artificial. Why is this working on me? Like that scene is very similar to the opening where it's like, here's the director and the musicians and the cast all saying like, okay, let's start. And just like marching out into the street and doing it. Yeah. Um, and I do think like the whole movie has a level of quote control there. Like I believe the director knows exactly why he wants certain scenes to feel very artificial and other feels ones to not like, I think he knows why he is cutting to these like fake, not E true Hollywood story, like fake E reporting type things. Like I think he, the director has an idea that every step along the journey, he is like whipping you into some new location and that it's like, you will feel toyed with in a way that disarms you. Um, but yeah, it didn't. It didn't all work on me either. Like I, I don't know how many layers of ha ha knows it's in on the joke. It needs to be <laughs> before I get lost. But this definitely had more layers than I could keep track of in terms of like, you know, this is clunky. I know this is clunky. What am I supposed to get from this moment other than clunkiness? Like the relationship between Adam Driver and Marion Cotillard mostly felt like that, where they are all in love, but we never see them being in love except for them just singing that they are in love. Um, yeah. And, and, and I, I think, I think honestly, sorry, don't mean to interrupt, but like, sure. I think that is really my main problem with this film because I do think the overall story is interesting if you start from the boat. Mm -hmm. And I think. The problem is there's an hour before you get to the boat scene, which yeah. is them singing about being in love, but as you said, never showing it. So by the time we get to the boat scene, I'm already done with this film and I don't care anymore. Yeah. And then a, a thing happens on the boat and you go like, huh? And then the film's sort of commenting on the fact that like nothing becomes of that scene that happens. Um, but then there is a new thing that happens, which you think is going to take you down one path. And Adam Driver's character sort of spins it into another path that's like showing how right. much of a piece of shit he is. And yeah. like, I actually think this is a good story overall. I just have to sit through an hour of confusion and like not caring to get there. And I need moments of heightened tension or the accompanist accompanying people. <laughs> yeah. Like, it, it, yeah, it just, it's. No, well, I think the the part of the movie after the boat especially is where the artifice of it fits more like the baby is a puppet the movie feels fake but we are watching a story all about performance and exploitation and how hard can you like craft one thing to mean a different thing or whatever like i think i think it all fits together a little bit better whereas a romance especially romance with a character played by a major actress like a wonderful actress who i feel like does not get to do a lot in this movie at all um yeah. is just a kind of odd like i i agree I, I think the first part felt very odd too i just don't get any of it like you mentioned you know you did not enjoy the stand-up comedy i did i did not enjoy his first set at the orpheum at all the thing that he has opened with where like his comedy is basically it isn't even shock shock. He's not like insulting the audience. He's just like, hey, you're going to laugh now. Laugh, laugh, laugh. Bring out the girls. And like they start singing. It, it It's like a mix of like if you had some kind of comedian that just yells all the time. Like, I don't know what uh, Mark Maron used to be, apparently. <laughs> um, yeah, or Rory. <laughs> Rory when he's making up a set. Um <laughs> And then combine it with like Bo Burnham or Steve Martin, yeah. where it's just like orchestrated things happening around you. That's what um, that's when I text you. Like I was like, I wonder what Bo Burnham thinks of this performance that he's okay, giving yeah. in this scene. Because like it was it was that I scene thought... where he first walks out in his robe, where it's like things are timed to music and stuff. And I was like, okay, this definitely feels like it's like trying to be Bo Burnham, but also adding mm -hmm. an asshole to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I thought that might be what you meant, but I couldn't tell if we were that much on the same wavelength. But apparently yeah. we were. <laughs> <laughs> So that that scene was whatever for me. Uh, the scene in Vegas later when he has a little bit more of like a a breakdown and it does become more of just a 
this is one guy telling a very depraved kind of engaging ridiculous story is where i was more just captivated by adam driver's charisma in carrying the whole scene on his own um but yeah like but anyway both of those comedy scenes it's like am i supposed to believe those were actually good or edgy comedy probably not like i like i think the director knows that this is goofy and over the top and that the music is cheesy and he isn't saying a lot what does it mean that he's not saying a lot i don't know maybe i'm just like thinking myself into pretzels because this is an artsy movie so i want to give it more credit like (laughs) i feel like the movie is probably smarter than me but i don't get what it is doing a lot of the time (laughs) yeah one scene that did make me laugh a lot um at the Hyper Bowl is, um, so, you know, the announcer keeps announcing baby Annette in that, like, <laughs> you know, you're now prepared to ride this, you know, Disneyland ride voice that he does. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> you know, he keeps announcing her and she's not singing. And he's like, please be patient. Baby Annette is only a baby. And then off mic, he's like, what the fuck is that little bitch doing? <laughs> He's talking about a baby. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I I thought that was just absurd. (laughs) That was pretty good. (laughs) (sighs) So? Have we referenced Marion and Annette on mic yet? I don't think so. Okay. Marionette. Marion Cotillard. Annette, the baby. That's a good pun. (laughs) They're both puppeted. (laughs) Yep. <laughs> everyone, everyone is puppeted in this movie. That's the whole point. They're all puppets. Adam Driver is puppeted by the laughs of his audience. He can't. He wants to puppet them, but they puppet him. I don't know. I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, what do you say, Steve, when we get to our verdicts for this? <laughs> oh, the one thing I do want to say before verdicts is watching this movie did make me finally go back and watch Holy Motors, which is a movie that was on my list forever of things I should like feel bad about not seeing. Um, Holy Motors is A, way better than Annette, B, very great, and C, I think, covers territory that Annette tries to cover. Like The premise of Holy Motors is this guy, Mr. Isaac, drives around town in a limo having different appointments where his appointment is to be an actor playing a character in the world. And we never know why he just like is inhabiting different characters. And the movie is like him becoming all these different people throughout the streets of Paris. And it is like really, really cool and interesting. And it even has a very cool interlude where he and a group of people are like playing an accordion in a cemetery and like facing the camera and dancing and singing in a way that felt like the way a net opens. Um, All right. And I was like, okay, you've done this before and much cooler than you did it now. So even if this movie soured you uh, on the director, I would go back and watch Holy Motors. I actually think you would also enjoy it. Okay. Good to know. And you rented that on iTunes? Mm-hmm. Okay. Cool. Um, well, now on to verdicts. Uh, so, Stephen Miller, if you're going to say must see, record with a caveat, wait for rental, pass with a caveat, or a must avoid, what would you give it? Uh, it could go anywhere. I'm saying wait for rental because I thought this movie, the I thought the visual style, the fact that it all felt very artificial and operatic was enjoyable. I liked what Adam Driver was doing. I like getting to watch him go basically Nick Cage in this movie. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah, I don't know. The, the movie tickled me enough. Like I I was, I was intrigued enough by how over the top and ridiculous it was. And I do think the music, when you aren't paying attention to the repetitive lyrics, is pretty good. Um, but I don't think this is like a fantastic movie. I have no idea how it would feel like sitting at the festival watching it if I would be like blown away because I'm just jet lagged and have no idea what I'm about to watch. Um, I don't know. Whatever this movie is doing, I don't think I really get it beyond the vague ideas of love and performance and whatever. But I think it is. I think the movie itself knows those ideas are vague and is trying to have a joke about how one dimensional they are. And so I don't know where that leaves me in the end, but I thought it looked cool and I had fun not knowing what it was doing for two hours. Yeah. I'm going to give it a pass. The caveat. Um, I, I wish this, this wasn't theatrically released here, right? 
in the United States? I don't think so. Because I wish I could see like what the audience score is this. Because I feel like this is going to be like inherently because of what it is, it's going to be like critically well received. Um, mm-hmm. And I feel like an audience member who like bought a ticket and went in and watched this <laughs> would be very surprised. Oh by yeah, what they got. I think this would have a major gap. But this does not have a critical consensus either. This is like some critics have given this like two stars out of five. Like this is yeah. definitely not beloved by everyone. That's the best. That's basically my scale. <laughs> <laughs> um but uh yeah that's gonna do it for a review of annette uh Stephen miller people want to find you throughout the week where can they do that uh people can find me at twitter.com slash s david miller s david miller.com people can find me at christopher com or twitter.com slash christopher IRL. you can find the podcast over at the spoiler warning.com where you get a bunch of the back episodes of the show if you want to subscribe to the show you can do so on overcast stitcher apple Podcasts, or wherever podcasts are found if you want to know the episodes go live, you can follow us at twitter.com slash spoiler warning, facebook.com slash the spoiler warning, or instagram.com slash the spoiler warning. If you want to get a hold of us directly, you can send an email to fans at the spoiler warning.com, or you can use the contact form on our site. Music for this episode will come from the soundtrack to Annette, so hopefully you are enjoying that. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it for this week. Uh, we'll be back sometime soon. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye.